All right, it looks like we have a goodly number of people who have entered into the webinar. So good afternoon, friends and colleagues, and a special good morning to those of you on the West Coast. We are so pleased you could join us today for the webinar, Practical Solutions to Tax Issues Facing Employers with Increased Telecommuting. telecommuting. This is going to be a joint presentation by Baker Hostetler and the Ultimate Kronos Group. My name is Matt Hunsaker, and I am the leader of Baker Hostetler's state and local tax practice. Today, we're joined by a fabulous panel, including a few of our state and local tax attorneys. We're joined by Ted Bernert, who is a partner in our Columbus office, Dave Ebersall, who is an associate also in our Columbus off office, and then representing us from back east, we have Mike Sims, who is of counsel in our Philadelphia office. We're also pleased to be joined by Liz Bucko, who among many other things is the Senior Director uh, for Compliance Products at Ultimate Kronos Group. Before we get started and dive into these interesting topics, there are a few housekeeping items that we need to bring to your attention. If you would like CPE credit, a survey will be included in the follow-up email and your certificate will be sent upon completion. This presentation is scheduled to last for approximately an hour and a half and is available for one and a half hours of CLE credit in California, <clears throat> excuse me, Delaware, New York, Pennsylvania, and Texas, and in New Jersey via reciprocity. Credit is pending in Ohio, Virginia, and Washington State. And for all other states, uh, credit will be applied for as requested. Now, please note if you are, please note the following if you are applying for CLE credit. There are going to be two separate codes that will, that will appear in the slide deck during the program. They're not gonna be sneaky. You'll, you'll recognize them and we'll point them out. But what you need to do is please write down these codes because at the end of the webinar, a survey will appear and you will need those codes to answer all of the questions to that survey. Now, a word about questions. If you do have any questions during the presentation, please submit them. We hope that this will be very interactive. To submit them, you need to go down, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window and type in your question. We will not be able to receive questions via voice. It'll all be done through the chat feature. We'll try our best to answer these questions throughout the presentation and we will leave some time at the end to answer questions that we're not able to get to. And if we are not able to get to all questions during the time that is allotted, uh, our email addresses will be provided in the slides at the end of the presentation. And feel free to send us your questions following the program and we'll do our best to uh, provide some answers to those questions. A recording of the webinar is going to be sent to all attendees as well. All right, here's our beautiful faces. Now, normally I don't make a big deal of disclaimers. There's usually a big disclaimer at the beginning of every presentation and please read this disclaimer. But what I want to make clear is that we are in a very fluid situation, probably one of the most fluid situations that we've had to deal with in a long time in the state and local tax world. And so the information and the ideas that we present uh, are not meant to be legal advice and can very quickly become outdated. In fact, I was just reading a few presentations in preparation for this and noted that many of these 50 state maps are already you know, within a few weeks out of date. So please uh, continue to explore these issues uh, going forward. This will not be the end of the story. Now, today's topic is very timely, and the timeliness of it became apparent to me when I ran downstairs to get my suit coat so I could look presentable, and I pulled it off the hanger, and I realized that there was about a quarter inch of dust on the shoulders because I haven't pulled the thing out for who knows how many months because we're all working at home, and we're going to talk today about what are the implications of working at home not just as a result of COVID, but 
as a result, you know, may, as a result of COVID, we're probably going to have some long-term changes in how we do business. And we're going to talk about what the tax implications and the HR implications are of that changing environment. We want you to know what your tax environment is. And what we mean by that is, what are the rules that we're working with? Um, and we're going to be considering things like the impact of changing the place of withholding, not just on your employees, but what's that going to do to you as an employer and as a business? We're going to talk about where it's appropriate to revise or adopt policies and how to do that in a way that keeps your, customer, keeps your employees happy and also gets you to a point where you can handle the compliance burden and also keep your state and local taxes at a minimum. We're so pleased to have Liz with us who will help us to go through in detail the, the real salient issue of how to keep and maintain records, which is kind of the bedrock for how we comply with all of these rules. And our goal here today is to make sure that as you leave this presentation, you're not leaving with more issues that are going to keep you up at night, but hopefully we'll be able to give you some solutions to the problems that you're already aware of, or at least to give you a starting off point so you can start to, to wrap your head around how to handle these issues from a business standpoint. So we're going to start this off with a polling question. We'll give you some time to answer this as soon as it, it pops up on the screen. So this is the polling question. What is your role within the company? Are you in human resources? Are you in the legal department? Are you in the tax department? Are you one of the government folks out there? Or are you an other? And we're asking this question because we want to get you the right answers. We want to get you the information that's, that's most important to you. And so we really want to know who our audience is today. So go ahead and vote and we'll give it just a few more seconds and then we'll take a look at the results. All right, Dave, I think that's enough time. Okay, and you're there. All righty. So it looks to me like we got ourselves a pretty evenly split group here between HR, legal, tax, and others. And to two, you two government folks out there, we love you. We're glad that you could join us. And uh, hopefully hearing things from our perspective will be helpful to you as you implement policies. All right, with that, I am going to uh, turn the presentation over to um, Mike Sims, who is going to talk to us a little bit about the world of withholding for work at home employees. So take it away, Mike. Thanks very much, Matt. And kind of like you, who <laughs> dusting the, the dust off your uh, jacket, I am reminded every time I go into my closet and I have a plastic bag over a half dozen or so shirts that I got back from the dry cleaner and I look at the, the, ta the tag and it says ready for pickup March 8th, 2020. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so it, like you say, th this is a very relevant issue, and it, it gets more complex when you consider people working across your jurisdictions where their home and their office are in different either local jurisdictions, and, and Ted and Dave are going to talk about the impact of that in Ohio, and also if you're working across state borders, if your your home is in a different office from uh, or a different uh, state from your uh, normal place of employment. And so we're also going to talk about, uh, like Matt said, we want to present solutions, but we're also going to point out the tension between what an employer might want to do and be permitted to do or required to do and what an employee might want as, as the answer. And there are administrative aspects to that and uh, as well as some legal aspects. And we're also going to talk about how some of these policies that states have either either not given us guidance on, uh, and, and I think it's also a very, very important, something that I'm always saying, is that having a, a dialogue between government and state, uh, governments and taxpayers, is the way to get the best answer to some of these types of issues. 
Um, but these issues are affecting us right now during the pandemic, but they're also going to have some more uh, lasting impact. And the reason there is that it's, it's no surprise that many employers are already saying that they're going to cut down on the amount of real estate that they're using, and they're going to have more people working from home in the future. So we've seen some guidance from state and local governments uh, that's been provided, and we thank them for that. Uh, we're going to go through some of that. And uh, like I said, we're going to talk about not just the withholding issues, but we're also going to talk a little bit about how the um, working from home uh, situation can also have an impact on a corporation's uh, corporate net income tax or sales and use tax or other tax types of obligations. So let's take a, a hypothetical example here. And uh, I'm from the southeastern Pennsylvania area, Philadelphia. I'm not from there. I'm really from Pittsburgh, but I've been living in Philadelphia, uh, it seems like, forever. Um, but here, many people work in Philadelphia, but live in either nearby uh, New Jersey or Delaware. So it's not unusual for that kind of a situation to arise. But now, many of those people are working from home. So if we go down to the chart there, uh, if that employee is a New Jersey resident, from a Philadelphia perspective, they've published guidance on this, Philadelphia says that the employer may continue to withhold wage tax. And in that case, the employee would have to file a refund, but not until 2021. So right off the bat, we see some tension between what an employer may want to do, may be permitted to do. They could also choose under Philadelphia's guidance to not withhold if it's been the um, requirement of the employer that the employee work from home. Um, so you, you see some tension there. Do, do I want to have uh, change my systems and uh, stop withholding? Or do I want to keep my systems in place and allow the employee to file for a refund? Pennsylvania, on the other hand, says, no, we're not going to take into account the change in location. Pennsylvania says, uh, and there is a reciprocal agreement, reciprocity agreement between Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Pennsylvania has, has published guidance that says, no, continue to hold New Jersey tax on that New Jersey resident, which isn't surprising. But then if you look down to the Delaware uh, uh, row on the, on, the, um, on the little matrix there, Pennsylvania says that, hey, even if that employee whose office is normally in Pennsylvania is working from their home in Delaware, you have to continue withholding Pennsylvania tax. So then the question is, does that Delaware resident file a credit on their, for a, a credit for Pennsylvania tax that's been withheld like they had been in the past and get a refund of Pennsylvania tax withheld? And then you say, well, wait a minute, is, is that tax due to Pennsylvania and could Delaware deny that credit? So these are some of the issues that um, we're going to have to deal with. And I'm going to turn it back now over to Dave while we keep these kinds of things in, in our mind. And Dave's going to talk to us about the importance of knowing our tax environment. Dave? Right, that's right. And so as Mike's kind of describing just with that one example, you can see that there can be, you know, even in overlapping jurisdictions in the same geographic building the same place, you can have different rules for applying for different jurisdictions. So there are a few key points to the legal environment that um, are really important for employers to be aware of. And so we've got them uh, listed here on this slide. And on each one, but I've been around for a long time. Um, these are agreements that um, allow employers with non-residents in their state to not withhold for that non-resident employee if the non-resident employee certifies their non-resident status. And so, you know, that goes to show that uh, employees working from home is not a uh, totally new thing. This is something that um, has been very commonplace in some industries, but it's becoming more commonplace uh, across industries, at least in the shorter term with the pandemic. And, and you know, it remains to be seen how exactly that'll, that'll play out after the pandemic. Um, the convenience of the employer rule is another component of the um, uh, legal environment that, that uh, um, arises in many states. Um, that has to do with 
you know, where, where is the employee located and why? Is it for the employer for their personal reasons? There are special rules during the pandemic and, and potential legislation on the horizon. So um, I mentioned reciprocity agreements. These are really an area of emphasis, something that's very important because unlike some of the other things, um, some of the other components of the legal environment, this is something that um, we know works. You know, some of the special rules are subject to litigation. It's unclear when the pandemic will end and, and some of those special rules could end ab abruptly. Um, so the reciprocity agreements are really something to look into um, based upon where you're located because you know, th these are um, something you can rely on. So um, like I said, from the employer standpoint, you may not need, you do not need to withhold for non-resident um, employees if they certify their non-resident status. And from the employee's perspective, they can work in another state um, that's not their home state and, and not have tax withheld. Um, so I use the example here, Ohio, is a state that has reciprocity agreements with each of the surrounding states, Indiana, Kentucky, Michigan, Pennsylvania, West Virginia. So that means if you have a Pennsylvania resident working in, for, in Ohio, for an Ohio employer, um, the Ohio employer is not going to have to withhold if, if and this is a big if, the, um, the non-resident certification is submitted. So there's a practical side of this and um, Liz will talk about sim, uh, systems a little bit later in the presentation, but employers record keeping is going to be a big part of uh, these rules. And with a reciprocity agreement, the employer wants to make sure they have the, um, the employee's non-resident certification on file. It's, it's integrated into their systems. Um, you know, so, so those things are available if you need them, um, not just for your ongoing records, but in the case of an audit situation or something like that. So. Um, one thing that employers can do is to look at their business locations and, you know, for, for those locations, are there reciprocity agreements and how can we leverage these to make our payroll solutions a little bit easier? Um, and so we've included a chart here on the next slide that lists uh, the reciprocity agreements um, that we have in the United States. Um, and you'll see that, you know, these are very specific, you know, so, you know, one I like to, uh, you know, point out is the Texarkana, Texas and the Texarkana, um, um, Arkansas have a reciprocal agreement. So, you know, that goes to show that these rules can be very specific, they can be very localized, and it's um, important to really drill down into what the components of an employer's legal environment are. Um, and, and understand how they're localized and how um, the practical side of it works, um, which, which we'll touch on a little bit more further in, in the presentation. The convenience of the employer rule, this is another um, significant It looks like Dave has frozen up temporarily. We'll give him just a moment to unfreeze. Can you hear me now? Yes, Dave. Thank Please you. Continue. Um, so the convenience of the employer rule is something that, that six states have um, that will throw back wages for withholding purposes to uh, an employer's location if the employee is outside of, is working outside of that uh, location for their own purposes as opposed to the convenience of the employer. If on the other hand, they're outside of that um, base headquarters or the employer's location um, for the convenience of the employer, then, then those wages would be properly um, attributed to, it, to another state. But, um, you know, th this can have very um, kind of counterintuitive uh, results, if you will. We've, th this rule has been challenged. And, you know, the example I'll give you is this Huckabee versus the New York State Division of Tax Appeals case where you had a Tennessee resident um, who I believe was an IT worker um, working from home in, in Tennessee um, and, you know, did visit New York to work, but he really could have been in New York all of the time that he was working, but he was in home in Tennessee because that was convenient for him. And so New York asserted that 
his wages needed to be withheld in New York, even though he spent the majority of his time in Tennessee. And, and that seems like, a, and New York was successful in doing that all the way up to their um, you know, highest court of review. So, so it seems kind of intuitive that you'd have someone who's spending most of their time in Tennessee that you know, is subject to New York um, wage withholding, um, but these convenience to the employer rules can, can have that effect. Dave, I would just say, you know, I mean, the convenience of the employer rule is, is um, I think it just highlights the importance of, of really understanding the rules because things are not intuitive. I mean, that's not an intuitive rule and it just doesn't feel right. But nevertheless, New York has prevailed, at, you know, in their, in their court. So going with your gut doesn't always work. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Matt, because there's so many different localized rules and there's, and so, you know, a lot of times when we're looking at, you know, tax environments, you know, first in clay nations, like, okay, well, what makes sense here? And, and, you know, there may be a lot of very specific rules that you need to drill down and, and know what they are and, and keep in mind, keep that in mind. Uh, and so the next slide I'll talk about are special pandemic rules for um, work from home employees. So Matt said at the outset, this is a very fluid situation. And, um, you know, this is another example of that, you know, this is the most, you um, uh, up to date, you know, you know, at, at last check, th these are the states that have enacted um, special rules for work from home employees. Um, but it's really important to keep in mind that, that uh, you know, things are, things are evolving, you know, as, as we cope with the pandemic. Um, I've got kind of, and it's important to monitor them for that reason. So, um, you know, having a running tally of what the special rules are in the jurisdictions where um, your business is located is, is going to be, you know, an important component of uh, addressing these issues. Um, and we have, I, I've divided up the special rules into three categories here. So the one that we've really been focused on has been withholding for work from home employees. Um, and we have a number of states that um, have special rules. Many of these states have said that, you know, during the pandemic, and, and that's an indefinite period, that they will treat the employees as if they were still working in the office. Um, and so uh, Ted will talk about some legislation that's cropped up around that um, in a minute, but you're um, an employer located in one state and you've got now a new connection with a, a neighboring state because there's an employee working from home there there's this issue as to whether um, you've now created nexus, you've now um, have a connection to that neighboring state, even though you typically don't do business there because you have an employee working from home, does that create nexus? Um, several states have waived um, that, uh, that nexus triggering um, uh, during the pandemic. Um, and they, they've done it for corporate income tax and they've uh, done it for sales and use tax. Uh, a lesser number of states have done that as well. Um, so with that, I'll um, turn over to Matt. I believe this is our first break for the CLE CPE code. Yeah. So, so for those of you who are seeking CLE, this is the long of anticipated code. So please write down B, and I'm going to read it for those of you who may not have video. It's B H ampersam U K G one, which I think is short for. Baker, Hostetler, and UKG1. So write that down and uh, have that ready at the end of the program. With that, uh, we can go ahead and uh, why don't we hear next from Ted. And Ted, if you could talk to us for a little bit about the litigation of some of these pandemic tax rules. Uh, some of the current litigation and, and, and what you see coming down the pike. Uh, thank you, Matt. So uh, just a moment ago, Dave was talking about some of the statutes or administrative rulings that went into place that there are different variations of them, but essentially it's keep doing what you've been doing during the pandemic. And so the question is, what, what impact does that have on employers and employees? And I, I think we'll talk about it uh, some more, but th there is this, this uh, problem with the employer not wanting to have to change everything immediately, but the employee saying, wait a minute, I'm still paying tax 
in a state where I don't, I haven't been there since March. And so the first case we've got uh, is New Hampshire versus Massachusetts. And this is a case that is not on review at the Supreme Court, but it was an application under the original jurisdiction of the court because it's between two states. And the essence of it is New Hampshire does not have an income tax and they have more than 100,000 employees who are, are residing in New Hampshire, but go to Massachusetts or did go to Massachusetts before the pandemic. And so in, in that case, what we've got is a, a situation where the state of New Hampshire says, we don't have an income tax because we don't want an income tax. And so, um, I don't know, have we lost uh, the uh, screen at this point? If someone could help with that. So the, the, the concept here is that we, New Hampshire is saying we intentionally uh, did not have an income tax. We don't appreciate the state of Massachusetts saying that during this pandemic, the Massachusetts employer would continue to withhold for the New Hampshire employees, that that, that isn't right and that, that shouldn't be permitted. Now, this case is on, a, as I mentioned, under the original jurisdiction, uh, New Hampshire has requested that the Supreme Court hear it, but the, um, it has not yet been accepted. And it's not even entirely clear whether the court has to accept it, but in any case, we're keeping a pretty, keeping a, pretty a, a close eye on this. And uh, hopefully that this will be a situation where there might be some opportunity to, to look at, at this question. But for right now, it's just at the beginning. The next case that we have uh, is, is at the lowest level in Ohio, and it's the uh, Common Pleas Court case involving Buckeye Institute. Now, Buckeye is essentially a, um, a like a, a think tank. And they have um, their offices in Columbus, Ohio, and Columbus has a municipal income tax that's based on where you are located, where you're working. And this Buckeye Institute sued the Columbus City Auditor and said that it, it wasn't right that these individuals, well, that the, that the entity had to withhold for these individuals who weren't coming into Columbus. And the individuals also joined in the suit on the basis that they didn't want to pay the extra tax because Columbus has a higher tax than the surrounding areas. And in fact, there would be some townships that don't have the tax at all. So that challenge has been made in the trial court in Ohio. Uh, there have been motions to dismiss and those are being litigated right now. We really don't know what the Court of Common Pleas is gonna do. So the, the issue, this points out, I, I think the difficulties in this area where for some employers, you really would like to be able to continue withhold, but some employers want to be able to accommodate the employees and definitely some employees do not wanna be paying tax at the, at the office when if it were being assigned to their place of residence, they would pay less or no tax at all. So it, it kind of joins the, the issue, I think, uh, importantly for us. So and, with that, I'm sorry. Uh, Ted, I was just gonna say, and I, I think that one of the things that often gets missed in all of this is just how important these local taxes are. Because when we're talking about people working from home, the instances of people changing and going you know, many states away are, are relatively infrequent compared to people who may be working you know, just a few municipalities away. And so I, 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 you know, we've had some questions in the chat about local taxes. And I think this really highlights how local in nature some of these issues are going to be. So uh, it, in Ohio, we have a, a really terrible system. We have hundreds of municipalities. Uh, someone had asked about whether there's reciprocity agreements. There really aren't uh, in Ohio. And that's why we've got this issue and it's, it's causing a lot of problems. Uh, earlier, Mike had talked about the, the issues in, in Pen Pennsylvania being even different than Philadelphia. So the, the municipal issue is on top of the state issue. And um, again, we are seeing people work out of state, but it's really common to live in one municipality and work in another. 
So with that, Matt, I think I would, would pass it back to you for yeah. a polling question. Yeah, thank you, Ted. All right, here's our next polling question. All right. So the question is, which telecommuting employee issue concerns you the most? Expanded nexus for business taxes, being your company's income or sales taxes, proper withholding of employee taxes, the effects of work from home and withholding policies on employee morale and retention, which is often overlooked, not knowing if you're missing an issue that you really should be considering, and just managing all of this with very little guidance. So if you'll take a few moments to select from one of those options and we'll take a look at what's keeping each of you guys up at night. Um, Ted, while we're waiting for these to come in, we had a question about House Bill 197. Yes, so that's a reference to Ohio uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, the General Assembly stepped in and said that employers could continue to uh, withhold at the principal place of business being where they were uh, formally withholding. Uh, but it didn't address the question of whether employees could get a refund. And there, there is a, a challenge to it, which we talked about just a minute ago on the, um, the, uh, the, the Buckeye Institute. So yeah, we, we could spend all our time talking about Ohio, but we, we know that there are a lot of people who are all over the country. Uh, we would be glad to respond to individual questions. There's, you know, we're, there's hope that in Ohio, there will be a more permanent resolution of this. It's not likely in the lame duck, but next year there will be. So again, I didn't want to take all the time just with Ohio. Thanks, Ted. Appreciate you uh, answering that question. All right, I think that we can close the polling now and display the results. Okay, so I think it's pretty clear that the number one issue here is employee or employee withholding, followed by kind of the catch all, what the heck do I do since there's no rules yet? And uh, so hopefully we can uh, lay some of these to rest. Lindsay, if you want to advance to the next slide. Um, Ted, I believe that, that we're going to go back to you on this. If you could tell us just a little bit about looking ahead, what are some of the issues that, that we are going to be seeing? Yes, yeah, so the, the issue that we're dealing with and employers have to deal with is there is a lot of complexity and there is not um, much guidance at all. And what guidance there is is likely to change. So we, we wanted to sort of focus on what are the fundamental issues that employers are gonna to have to consider, notwithstanding the fact that we don't have answers. So the, the real answer to this is there needs to be federal and state legislation to deal with this. And um, uh, Dave's gonna talk in a minute about the, the federal legislation. Uh, there's surprisingly little state legislation out there. We, we hope the states are looking at this, but it's not at all clear. I don't think we should wait for the legislative relief because I, I just don't think the states are in a position to be able to do that. So as we've spoken before, and it's kind of a premise of what we're gonna be discussing for the rest of our time together, is employers and employees do not necessarily have common interests. So the employer would like to accommodate the employee, but to do that would put at risk some um, issues for the employer being they're going to have to change their method of, of reporting. And they could also be subject to additional tax in jurisdictions where they worked before. So if what you're saying is, yes, I have this employee. Yes, they're sitting uh, in this state and we want them there. Uh, then the issue becomes, well, have you expanded your, 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 uh, your tax liability? So what we're gonna be doing for the rest of our time together is saying, okay, despite the problems, what do you need to do in looking ahead and trying to decide what to do? And so with that, turn it over to Dave and ask you to talk about what's happening in, in Congress. Although of course, you know, we're at the end of that, that session. But anyways, if you tell us what's happening, please. 
Yes, thank you, Ted. Um, so there are two bills before Congress that um, really have been present, um, you know, before the pandemic, the idea being just a mobile workforce. And it's kind of a little bit of a different issue when we are talking about, you know, systemically um, employees working from home as opposed to those who are traveling. Um, but, you know, they, they would, you know, address this situation. Um, the first we have listed there is the Multi-State Worker Tax Fairness Act. Uh, this is an act that would establish a physical presence rule for in tax, income tax purposes, meaning that if you're physically present in, in a state, um, that would create a, a nexus to tax. Now, that might be a, a little aggressive. I think, you know, it, it would be. Um, and so that really lends itself to another bill that's been, um, you know, advocated by many, and that's the mobile workforce uh, bill, the Mobile Workforce State Income Tax Simplification Act, which would create a 30-day safe harbor. So if you were to travel to, um, you know, if you had an Ohio employee traveling to, you know, say Tennessee, uh, well, Tennessee's a bad example, um, so, uh, tax there, but let's say we had an Ohio worker traveling to New York, um, that would give them a 30-day safe harbor before they um, would, would trigger nexus. So, um you know, like Ted said, it's going to be the end of the session, and, and there's a lot on uh, the plate in Congress, but, um, you know, there, there are two bills that have been out there. Lindsay, can we go to the next slide? All right. Dave, thanks for covering that. Um, we're going to transition here now to talk a little bit about best practices, and those would include taking a look at your your state tax profile and really understanding what it is and how it all fits in with the, the work from home environment. We're gonna talk about policies, changing policies, updating policies, communicating policies. And then we're gonna talk about record keeping. Some of the things you need to do to keep records so that when the auditors come, you are able to substantiate your, your positions that you've taken. And then we'll finish off with some of the, the business solutions. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll go ahead. And I think that probably what makes the most sense is to turn this back over to Mike, who can talk a little bit about how the, the work from home environment affects a company's tax profile. So if Mike, if you'll take that away. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Matt. And based on the response from the last question, it seemed like some of you, maybe I forget it was 20, 25% or so, were curious about what the rules would be for taxes other than withholding, even though the most, the majority of you are looking for answers on how you should withhold. And like I mentioned in the beginning, having an employer working at home in a state that is not a state in which the company had been doing business before could give that company exposure to income taxes, franchise taxes, sales and use taxes. Dave's gonna talk about that in a second. Um, but the important thing here, I think to recommend is in what I've done with some clients and some of you are on the uh, listening to the webinar is uh, to put together a matrix and say, okay, where is, you know, if you have an, a, a group of companies say for each one of your companies, what is the off which which states do they currently have offices in or are they doing business in uh where are where is the principal place of business for the employee before the pandemic where is it after the pandemic are they working from home and then say okay is there a reciprocal agreement a reciprocity agreement and if not what is the consequence of this from a, an employer withholding perspective and then adding another column to the matrix, what is the answer then for um, uh, income taxes? Another column for, for sales and use taxes. So it's kind of like playing three-dimensional chess. And, and like Ted and Dave have been pointing out, it's not just a state that you have to look at, but the multiple localities that may or may not be imposing withholding taxes. And, you know, maybe they have different income tax rates and things like that. So it, it really gets very complicated. The good news is that there are some federal laws that could minimize the additional compliance burdens that one might have. Um, 
as a result of employees working from home in a state where the, the company was not doing business before. And that would be public law 86-272 and also some court cases that say if you only have a de minimis amount of activity in the state, you're not going to be subject to that state. We don't have time to get into those today, but 86-272 is a law that applies to sellers of tangible personal property. But the bad, and that's the good news, the bad news is it doesn't apply to somebody who's selling services. So you wouldn't be able to avoid the income tax filing requirement and subjectivity as a result of um, public law 86272 if you were in the service business. The other good news, we're not only here with bad news today, the other piece of good news is, as was pointed out on slide, I think 13 or 14, um, many states, a couple dozen or so, have come out with um, statement saying that if you have an employer working from home uh, as a result of the pandemic and that's the only contact contact that you have with our state we are not going to maybe we maybe we are permitted to subject you to tax but we're not going to impose our income taxes um, or uh, and maybe a sales and fewer states have the the um, uh, 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 excuse you from the uh, sales and use tax responsibility. So, but there again, I would go back and I would say, look, let's let's just put together, let's put this this three dimensional chess on on a little matrix, and let's figure out because you're gonna, you, as I gave in my example, you're gonna have different results for different states, different results for different localities. And I'll before I hand it over to Dave to talk about some of the sales and use tax issues here. I'll conclude by saying the good news here in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia is that both of those jurisdictions have published guidance that says if your only contact is an employee who had with our state or our city is the, the, um, the, the, an employee working from home where they had been not working uh, from home before, we are not going to impose our income tax uh, or in the case of Philadelphia net profits tax and BERT. Um, we're not going to impose those taxes on the uh, on the business. And then finally, uh, uh, many states, almost every state has a single sales factor, but some juris local jurisdictions, for instance, Philadelphia, have uh, an apportionment formula that includes a payroll factor. And, Pennsylvania, and Philadelphia has said, no, we are not going to um, change your apportionment or you're not going to be having to require, you're not going to be required to change your apportionment factor as a result of an employee that you've required to work from home. So Dave, you want to talk to us about sales and use tax consequences as well? Yeah, thanks, and, Mike. Um, hey, Dave, before you get started, let me interject with, with one question, which I think just dovetails really nicely with your presentation. So I want to give you the question first, and then you can weave your answer in as you go over your slide. But the question was asked, the issue of physical presence to tax appears to have been resolved with the Wayfair case. Do you agree? <laughs> so if you can answer that question in connection with this slide, that would be wonderful. Sure. So the, the sales and use tax environment is definitely um, very different than it was just, just a few years ago. Um, a couple developments, one being the Wayfair case. So, um, you know, Wayfair is a case where internet retailers that did not have a physical presence in South Dakota were deemed to have nexus with South Dakota due to their economic activities there. Um, this The South Dakota law being, um, I believe, over $100,000 in um, in-state sales or over 200 transactions. Uh, and so what that case is saying is that states are allowed to um, tax businesses based upon their economic activity in the state alone, regardless of um, whether, you know, even if they don't have a physical presence in that state. Now, an interesting um, kind of application comes up um, in the context of well, if you kind of flip that and you say you have a, a physical presence that's very limited, um, would that create nexus? So if you have, say, in the context of employer withholding, if you have an employee that's in a state for one day or a period of hours um, for work purposes, would that limited physical presence create nexus? I think that's a little bit of, uh, of an open question. Um, but, you know, in some states, at least from the state's perspective, they would um, potentially continue to argue that that limited physical presence would would create nexus. And I, I think Matt, maybe you know that that might address um, 
the the question that we had. Um, yeah, David, and um, I think Ted had some Ted had some comments that he wanted to make as well in that regard. Ted. So in the litigation that we talked about earlier, uh, Wayfair was a, a big part of that in the discussion, and the idea being, doesn't Wayfair change everything? And, and you know, I think the the governments are pushing that issue, but that's by no means clear. We could go into it, but the the issue with collecting use tax is is different than imposing an income tax on somebody who isn't in the uh, uh, in the jurisdiction that's taxing them at all. So. I don't think Wayfair answers the question. It does change maybe the environment some, but it doesn't really change what we're thinking about. If you don't, if you're not in the city at all, you know, some people would say there cannot be an income tax, while others would say there are other reasons why they should continue to do that. So I guess I just wanted to jump in on on Wayfair. Uh, if I could, Matt, I just we got a question about Ohio, and I'm sorry to keep beating the dead dog here, but the issue was that we had this bill that gave a, a safe harbor for employers on collecting um, or withholding tax. What if the employer had already been doing some withholding in the places where the residences are? I don't think we would recommend that you change your policy necessarily, but it's just that that bill was, was focused on the idea that employers would be not doing what, what is being proposed, which is to do some withholding based on where the people are located. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Ted. Back to you, Dave. Okay, so thank you both. Um, so the sales and use tax environment, um, if we're back to that, you know, is, is an environment where states have, uh, or at least think they have more um, ability to a certain nexus and, and the ability to tax. And you combine that with a pandemic environment where the decreased economic activity has hit um, state budgets and, and the revenue raised by sales and use taxes. Um, and this, you know, could be a more a hotter issue um, with respect to state sales and use tax enforcement. And so the economic nexus laws are a big component of that. Every state um, except Florida and Missouri now have uh, every state with a sales tax except Florida and Missouri has now adopted an economic nexus standard of some type. Um, and marketplace facilitator laws are, are a new type of law to keep on your radar. These are laws um, that are, are designed to address online platforms such as Amazon or eBay, but they have a much, much broader reach than that. Uh, you know, any sort of um, platform, online platform, where um, a vendor is making um, items available for sale for sellers to use that platform. The facilitator um, is now subject to the sales and use tax uh, question responsibilities. Um, and so this is this is a broad change that um, you know we can wrap our he heads around um, with some issues. But when you start thinking about how this applies to services or digital goods, um, you can start to see that there are many applications that this could apply to. Um, that it's, it's, it's important as you're reviewing your state tax profile to think about, you know, okay, is this somehow um, something that, you know, your company or business could be considered a marketplace facilitator? Or, you know, if you're a seller using one of these platforms, how are you going to now um, interact with that facilitator with respect to record keeping and things like that? Um, so, you know, this is, this is a a very hot environment where we have new economic nexus laws and, and marketplace facilitators laws combined with the state appetite um, to tax conceivably due to you know budget shortfalls. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, ways to trigger nexus um, for sales tax purposes. Uh, like we said, economic activity sales um, Sales or the number of transactions can do it. Um, employees in the state, physical assets in the state. We talked about marketplace facilitator laws, storing products there, um, having affiliates in the state. You know, states take very aggressive positions depending on the on the circumstances, and they'll look into your um, level of affiliates, um, even marketing activity, um, click through nexus where you have an affiliate. You know. Um, um, who you're working with to sell goods online, um, warranty repair. So th there are, um, 
you know, states will take very aggressive positions to identify a connection with the state that will establish uh, an ability to tax. So, um, you know, it's important for the employer to review the state tax profile. And, and in the context of, you know, we've been talking about income tax withholding, registering, if there's something that triggers income tax reporting, now you're on the radar for that state, um, the employer is, and that could, you know, cause the state to look into other types of tax registrations that, that we've been talking about. So, um, Lindsay, the next slide, please. I'll also talk a little bit about unemployment insurance taxes. Um, generally, a state is only going to look, um, or generally, um, employers will only be subject to unemployment insurance contributions uh, for any one employee in, in just one state. Um, typically, you're not going to have overlapping responsibilities. And, and the conventional tests that most states have adopted are uh, kind of a tiered structure uh, in order of priority. So the first thing to look at is where is the service localized that the employee, employee is providing to the employer. And, you know, sometimes that test doesn't answer the question because the employee is um, working in more than one, you know, jurisdiction um, or state or, or uh, you go to the next test and that's where's the base of operations for that in, in employee. Um, the third test being where the employee is being directed or controlled from. And if all else fails, going to the employee's residence um, provided that there's a connection, that the employer has a connection to that employee resident state. Uh, in the next slide, please. You know, but this is another situation where agreements among the states can offer employers, uh, you know, serious solution to the issue um, as to where to withhold. Um, the interstate reciprocal coverage arrangement is a multi-state agreement among 45 states where employers may elect to report and pay in one state for any particular employee, provided that um, a couple conditions are met. One, that the employee services are performed in that state, um, the employee resides in the state, or the employer has a place of business in the state, that being the first. And second, there is an approval process with the appropriate state agency to, to, to have that go through. So, um, you know, th there are solutions for unemployment uh, insurance tax purposes as well, but it's, you know, an, another situation where we have extremely specialized and localized rules. And these are rules that may not go hand in glove with the income tax, the employer withholding rules. So, you know, this is something, again, to be careful with, to monitor, um, monitor the legal environment, monitor uh, where you have locations and employees to make sure that, you know, you're applying the, the appropriate rules. Yeah, and Dave, I think I it's think so important both. also to 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 make sure that when you make your withhold your unemployment withholding decisions, that you're also thinking about your your uh, withholding decisions, and if they don't match up, to be able to document and articulate why the income tax withholding and the unemployment uh, insurance aren't matching up. That's right. Thanks, Matt. Can we go to the next slide, please? I think that's that's mine, Dave. So um, we're now going to try to get down to the practical side of things. We've been talking about the issues, and there are a lot of issues out there. And we realize that this it's very tough for employers. And we're trying to think about what proactively employers should consider during this time at year end, and then also. We expect that after the pandemic ends that the states will be uh, proposing new rules with respect to withholding because of increased telecommuting. So what we're proposing is not that you necessarily should have a policy, but you should consider in having a um, explicit written proposal. The purpose of it would be to, well, there's several purposes. One, it forces the organization to actually confront the issues and what, the, what it is that they want to do. Um, it will allow people in payroll to have something they can point to if an employee or someone in the C-suite says, what are we doing and why? Uh, it could be helpful in the context of the convenience of the employer. 
so that the issue would be, should you, I'm not saying it's always the, the best case, but should you be providing that the people are working because the employer wants them to be at home and not in the office? Uh, we don't have any direction from New York on that, who's the leader in this area. And I don't think we know how that works, but it's it's something to think about. So there, there are some reasons we think, the other point I would make is that it could be later on the taxing authority will come to you and say, well, why did you do what you did? And the feeling is having a, a policy could possibly be used for penalty relief in that context. Now, the, the problems of course, uh, with having a policy is it needs to be up to date. And this is a very fluid uh, situation. If you did uh, want to employ a policy, you're going to need to keep track of what's happening, especially once the pandemic hits. The yeah, second I think that's, uh, I was just gonna say, I think that's so important because not, you know, this pandemic will end eventually, I, I hope. And the audits are gonna be rolling in perhaps years down the road and people have maybe moved on. So having this documented in a policy is gonna be so helpful for audits that are being handled by perhaps other people down the road for the company. Yeah, Matt, and, and if I could jump in too, Ted, and, and you and I have talked about this, that it's also important to get other um, departments within an organization to weigh in on the policy because kind of like there is the tension between the employer and the employee, employee that we've talked about. There can also be some, as we've seen, some tension between the way you want that policy to read for tax purposes and the way some of the labor lawyers may want it to read. Yeah, that, that's right, Mike. And, and to sort of pick up on that idea of going to the last uh, item there on that, that page, is we're also thinking about does what's happening right now suggest that employers are going to need to start tracking locations. I think one person asked, that, well, what about RVs? I mean, the, there are a number of different circumstances that, that could be in play here. And as, as Mike said, in the context of the, of the policies, I think the uh, labor lawyers and the uh, privacy lawyers are gonna have something to say about keeping track of the locations of the employees. But it is something that's probably worth, worth considering in, in going ahead. Uh, especially if you decide to accommodate the employees. And we're very pleased um, that Liz is available to help us think about what a, um, an employer should do, what questions should they ask, and, and generally speaking, what should they be looking at if they do decide to jump over the cliff and, and start keeping track of, of where the uh, employees are. So Liz, if you could take it from here. Sure, you can go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, I work at UKG. My team really works around compliance assurance. So we do a lot of things to help um, within our products to ensure that the products are developed and delivered in such a way that the clients can use them to track and enforce that compliance. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, one of the real um, opportunities, and you guys probably have this in your um, HCM, which is human capital management offerings or your payroll offerings, depending on if those are one and the same or two different solutions. But ensuring you have the employee in the right home and work location is, is really important um, on, a, on an ongoing basis. Most systems today will allow the employee to change their home location. And, um, you know, Historically, we went through with our customers and we looked at why they were doing tax adjustments. So when you guys answered that poll, right, and you said, my biggest worry is, do I have my employees being withheld properly in the right place? Um, so, so years and years ago, we went through and we did a survey. And one of the number one reasons for um, corrections was an employee was in the wrong home. Look they had their home wrong or their work location wrong. Um, systematically, our solution, which there's lots of them on the market, I'm sure there's a variety out there um, for the participants, um, the, we made it where the administrators or the managers can update their work location, but the employee can't. Um, they can update their home location and they can indicate if they're an employee working at home, a virtual employee, and the software will then take their address and put it in the appropriate um, uh, jurisdiction all the way down to the rooftop. Zip code is not enough because in places like Ohio or in Kentucky, 
you might be in, in one, considered in one tax location for a school district tax and another one for your lo local withholding. So you can use your solutions that you have out there for HR and payroll to ensure the employee is not only keeping up with their address properly, but again, is also that, that you're ensuring that the, down to the rooftop, it's got the right jurisdiction attached to it. We can go to the next slide, please. Uh, additionally, one thing that you can do through your solutions, and for those of you who might have workforces like con construction people, right, that are out in the field all the time, and they aren't really at home, this should be available in most modern pieces of technology in a um, electronic format. These are the forms at the federal level. It's your W-4. At the state levels, it's typically a state four. Um, different states have different names for them. And in Michigan, there's actually some locals where you need to make these elections. But keeping up with these forms and making sure when an employee changes their address that your solution sends the to this form or, or minimally your payroll administrators, make sure they get this form if you're still doing paper tracking of um, withholding elections so that now you know the employee is in the right home location down to the taxation jurisdictions that are applicable in the right work location down to the tax jurisdictions that are applicable. And then you're getting their individual elections so that your withholding is accurate. We can go to the next slide. Um, in those systems, you should be able to um, then, via your time, time module, if you have employees that clock time, um, a lot of customers have expense modules or expense systems that will track where an employee was when they filed the expenses. And for our, some of the consulting firms or and even law firms, they have the ability to, they input um, users input time so that you can bill your clients properly. And that's an excellent opportunity to add record keeping for, I've input my time and I was in New York City, or I've input my um, time to bill and I was in Colorado. You know, so you have that data in your system so that then when you go to pay them, here's an example of a check for an employee who worked 40 hours per week at a Milwaukee location, 20 in a Boston location, and 20 in a Pittsburgh location. So that data should come over from whatever system you're using to track time in, or you can overwrite it if you're a smaller company and you can just enter it into the check or overwrite it in the check. So that now we've put them in the right location, we've tracked their time and ensure we've got them allocated properly to the right jurisdictions. And then if we go to the next slide, you know, we go into calculating that payroll to ensure if you see at the bottom of this that, that they're being withhold, withheld properly um, based on how their time. Um, most systems, so we talked a lot about reciprocity today. A lot of system will automatically apply that re reciprocity. I don't know of a system out there today that can't control the reciprocity. So as a payroll administrator um, or your, your payroll administrators and your team can check boxes to say like not subject to or um, exempt um, from wages based on the employee elections and the reciprocity um, if your system isn't automatically recognizing that reciprocity so that the right amounts are withheld. So for example, like New Jersey, I think their rule is withhold anything over the rate in the alternate state. So it just depends on the locations, but your system should be able to help facilitate ensuring you're calculating that correctly um, with the reciprocity in mind. We can go to the next slide. Um, and then obviously you need to make sure you're remitting. This is just a tax screen that shows where customers' um, taxes are remitted and make sure they're getting to the right jurisdictions on time and that you've got the right information for sending out that reporting. And that reporting goes all the way to W-2, right? Because if I have an employee that's worked in 25 states in a year, they're going to get a much bigger W-2 because it's going to have all the different um, wages accumulated there. Um, let's see. I don't know if anybody put anything in the Q&A. Um, we can go to the next well, slide. Well, we we do let's, we do have one question, and the, the, anyone feel free to weigh in on this. But this was an interesting question because we talked a little bit about uh, employees requesting refunds, and so the question is, what employer record keeping is prudent to respond to employees who ask the employer for documentation to support a tax refund request? Um, I think that it depends on typically any tax refunds for income tax 
Um, as well as even if you're ever withheld on Social Security, let's say I worked at one organization for four months of the year and another for, for eight months and I get, they're both going to withhold Social Security like I've never had anything withheld. So by the end of the year, I could have an extra. Typically, the individual should get those refunds. Um, so maybe they you, you withheld in a state that they don't actually have the liability in. That should happen as part of their um, their personal individual tax filing process um, of their 1040 and their state returns. Um, typically, that's not something we would see an employer do. Um, if an employer has made a mistake, let's say that um, however your solution works, you only have state abbreviations, so you withhold in Minnesota instead of Michigan, right? Because you get the state abbreviations wrong. Um, yeah. So it, there, depending on your system and the time of the year and you discover it, a lot of times there's way you, ways you can work that system to swap those buckets. Um, but generally, if the employee needs a refund, they, that's typically managed with their individual year in process and not via the, the organization, unless it's a mistake. And then you have to work with your system provider, which you can switch those buckets usually and make that work. All right, thanks, Liz. No problem. We can go to the next slide. Um, so really, if we wanted to kind of recap, right, make sure you're getting people in the right work locations with the right jurisdictions, um, your expense records, your billing systems, great ways to see where people were, depending on how your organization works, um, and then make sure you're keeping those tax withholding statuses current. And Liz, if I can interject with one more question, which I think is really good, and this is why I've seen quite a few people ask is, what do you do record keeping wise when you have people who are not purely work at home versus purely work in the office? Because I know a lot of companies have, have a rotational system right now just to keep the number of people in the office minimized, but they're not completely closed. So what are the what are the ways to handle that record keeping when you have when you have these people who may be back and forth in different uh, locations? So the option I've, I've discussed would work, right? Like having them report it. Um, a lot of us who are salaried employees that just aren't used to tracking our time because we don't need to bill hours or anything like that, um, that becomes a little burdensome. And so people may not do that. Um, one way that, um, at least in our solution, maybe every solution is going to be different, but you can facilitate that by doing um, what we call a fixed allocation. So if I know that, you know, I'm going to go into our Atlanta office two days this week, three days next week, so that basically I'm spending 50% of my home time working in my home in Decatur, Georgia, and 50% of my time working in our office in Atlanta, Georgia. Let's say those localities have taxes. They don't, but if they did, um, then you could do a fixed allocation where you could allocate me 50% of the time to Atlanta, 50% to Decatur. More often than not, especially up in the Northeast, we see people working 50% of the time from Connecticut. 50% of the time from New York. And if you do those permanent allocations, then the only time you need to change them is if there's a, an override, right? If you have an exception to that process, I end up coming into the office for a month or staying home for a month. Um, so there's, there's lots of ways you can do that, but we do see quite frequently in the Northeast people doing those fixed allocations. We can go to the next slide. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of data out there. I actually sent, sent the team a Wall Street Journal article I saw this weekend asking these same questions, discussing the same concerns businesses may have about um, virtual working. I suspect that a lot of companies have figured out that, that it's a nice expense saver and it incre will increase, you know, employee effectiveness if I'm not commuting. You know, at, at Atlanta, my 17 mile commute typically takes an hour to an hour and a half to go into the office here. So I've gotten back a lot of my day, which makes me a happier person, theoretically. Um, after eight months, I don't know, I might want to go to the office. But, um, but um, so I think that, that companies have realized as, as a result of the pandemic working scenarios that we're going to have more and more employees asking to work remotely or making a condition of work, as well as companies um, doing that. So you know, I think record keeping is going to be become really important and, and your technology solutions should be able to enable this um, from onboarding all the way to, um, you know, producing a check and paying your tax returns and, and you're producing your, your year end slips like your W2s. Um, I think there's some key things to this, making sure that you're capturing data in the beginning and keeping those documents digitized so you have that trail. 
um, focusing on keeping the tax withholding information updated and current, um, ensuring a timely delivery of forms. So, you know, when a new policy comes in or a new law gets passed, you ensure you push out that information and get all the, the, the data you need. Um, and then security is important. You, you still have to remember this is all PII data, right? So making sure that you have the appropriate security for those remote employees um, and, and with this information that you're tracking and keeping. Are there any additional yeah, questions? I, I think we're good for the moment. We'll, I think we'll save what we have now for, uh, for the conclusion, but uh, Liz, I think you hit the nail on the head there with the last part about just how important uh, it is to uh, make sure that you have good security practices in place with very highly personal and confidential employee information. Well, at and, this point, you know, sorry. Um, no, interestingly ahead, enough, there's, you know, we saw GDPR, um, uh, the global data privacy regulations come out, and then we have seen Europe get really tight on them. Um, there is a law that just passed in California about privacy. So remember with security, you not only have to think about obtaining the information to track this, holding this information, but you also have to think about removal of the information. So when you've held it long enough, purging that data from your systems. Um, so record keeping is important, but part of record keeping is that, um, that purging of information as well. Yeah, you really have to take the whole life cycle from the acquisition, the protection to the disposition. Well, with that, I think that we'll go uh, now to a, a short discussion. Um, if we can go on to the next slide, Lindsay, uh, about some just practical business solutions. And Ted, I think it would be great if you could walk us through these, these issues for now. It, thanks, Matt. So we're trying to, to sum up at this point. I, I would say that the question of the privacy and there are some labor law issues involved in as you start tracking the employees, we, we considered including that, but they're, they're worth their own presentation. There's their own sets of complexity. So we decided just to fo focus on the, the tax in the time that we have allotted rather than get into other areas, which we admit are really important. So what we're trying to do now is just summarize where we are and, and what recommendations we would make. And so as, as we've suggested before, the reciprocity agreements are the best answer here in our opinion, if you're able to qualify. So uh, earlier was a chart about which states, which localities allow some sort of reciprocity uh, approach. That way you're withholding at the uh, home of the individual that works under most circumstances that we're dealing with, pandemic, post-pandemic, whatever. We, we do suggest looking at these COVID-19 safe harbors. You know, nothing's sacred, they have been challenged. I would note in the two cases that challenged them, they didn't go after the employers, they went after uh, the, the state or the city that was imposing these requirements. So while it, it's probably not bulletproof, it, it's probably fair to consider uh, applying the COVID-19 safe harbors, if that's the way it is. And of course, some of these safe harbors, that may not be the right expression. Massachusetts will want you to withhold, and that may not be a safe harbor. It's more mandatory. Uh, the obvious point, track legislation and tax agency announcements. And that's especially true because there could be a watershed change once the uh, uh, COVID-19 period passes, which it will shortly, hopefully. Uh, we have asked you to examine all implications of a policy. So, you know, there, there are advantages to the employees or maybe advantages to the employer, but there are risks involved. There's additional cost of compliance and the possibility of being subject to tax in additional jurisdictions. And then finally, I think it's probably worth at least considering implementing a more detailed system to, to track employees. So that, that completes it, Matt. Thanks, Ted. And and really, I think that that, that last part is really important. I think that we have been really good about tracking employees who get paid by the hour, but now we have so many people who are salaried that are working from different locations who aren't really accustomed to uh, you know, necessarily keeping a, a timesheet. And so uh, 
you know, there's going to be a little bit of a, a, a shift, at least in culture, to to help all employees to be real robust in their reporting of where they're located. Lindsay, if you can move us to the next slide. Uh, this is the final CLE code. It is BH and for Sam UKG2. Baker Hostetler and UKG2. If you'll please write that down for the end of the presentation. All right, I think everyone should have that down. So uh, now we've reached the fun part. Uh, we've answered quite a few questions as we've gone along, but we have a little bit of time left over to, uh, to dig into some of the questions that we didn't get to as we went along. So I'm gonna throw out some of these questions to our panel and uh, we'll see if we can't get some of these uh, questions answered. Uh, let's start with this one. Uh, would you agree that parties, and I think what we mean there is employee and employers and others cannot by agreement control how, uh, you know, how the, employment is taxed. What are some thoughts on that question? So Matt, let me weigh in because that, that's coming from a friend of mine who's with the government. And, and I think that it, it raises, I think a really important point. The, the idea being, can the employer dictate where withholding should, should happen? And, and I think that of course that's you know, hard to uh, argue that the taxpayer can control the tax situation. But a couple of things. I, I think the taxing authorities need to take into account that the employers really are caught in the middle. You know, these are taxes of the individual employees. The employers are trying to do the best that they can. And I, I would hope that the taxing authorities would, would consider that as we go forward. And then, and then the second thing is that, um, you know, the, um, it isn't clear that the employers can just assume that the taxing authorities won't take an aggressive position later on. And, and so I think from that perspective, that's why we're thinking about maybe having a policy so that you can explain what you've done uh, down the road. Okay, thanks Ted, great answer. Uh, next question is, uh, and I'll paraphrase this because this has come in, in in several different permutations. But the, the the question is, what do we do with new hires? So we have a, a a work location office, and employees are you know due to to COVID are are, are working from home away from that location, and there may be some election to be taxed still at that location. But what do you do to someone who who is new? and just joined the company and go straight into a work from home environment outside of the jurisdiction uh, where the company's office is located. Hey Matt, I'll, I'll take a stab at that and uh, answer it with maybe a, a couple of questions. And I think it would depend on how the agreement, the employment agreement is worded. And does that employment agreement contain any language that says your principal office is wherever? Uh, does it also say that this is your principal office and uh, until uh, you're permitted to work in that office, you may work from home or, or I'm sorry, we're gonna require you to work from home. Uh, I, I think it would depend on facts like that that are included in the em employment agreement, whether they would be viewed as initially working as their office being their home or um, the, uh, you know, the bricks and mortar of wherever the, the office is. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great answer. And I think it, it really is important to make sure that that's documented and that they do have a a work location noted in their employment agreement. Any other thoughts on that? Or are we ready for another question? So I'd like to talk to that, especially in the New York City or New York State context. So the, the, the question is, if, if you as an employer say, we want the employee to work from home, um, 
that's that's something that is, is a policy. It's not that the employee just out of their own is deciding to do it. And, and that's a really hot topic. Um, I don't believe the, the New York authorities have given us guidance on that. And so that's one of the areas that we just don't know. Can you change the convenience of the employer designation by putting a policy in that the individual should continue to work from home, you know, in order to, to save cost of, of rental or just because you care about their, uh, you know, their health. And, and we just, we really don't know the answer to that. And, um, yeah, and, and so many times the, the, the reason for the work at home may be the company is saying, don't come back, <laughs> stay in Tennessee, don't come back because we want to minimize the, the spread of COVID. And so I think, like you say, Ted, it's the open question of, does that become the convenience of the employer, their desire not to uh, have transmission you know, of the virus and just not a lot of guidance on that question. Uh, Dave, we haven't heard from you for a little while. And so I got a question that I think that you should, if you can answer this question, you are the most brilliant person in the world because it's a question that's been asked for a decade and no one gets it right. Uh, what is the likelihood that either of the, the federal bills get enacted in the new Congress? And Dave, I, you, you're, you don't appear to be on mute, but we can't hear you. All right, we can't hear Dave. So uh, Dave, while you figure out the tech side, let's, let's hold that question for Can just you hear a me second. now? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there you go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so the two bills that we discussed are pending in the, you know, the present Congress that is, is rounding to a close. And I, I think part of the trouble with all of the special legislation and administrative rules that we've talked about today is that, um, you know, we don't know if they're going to be, uh, when they're going to end. You know, when will the pandemic end? A lot of them are in place during the, the course of a stated emergency, but they can end abruptly after that occurs. And so there's a need for legislation. It's, it's definitely out there. Um, but my feeling is that, you know, the, the prospects for, um, you know, a coherent, unified uh, solution through legislation is, is, you know, I'm not overly hopeful for that. Um, and, and like I said a little bit ago, there's, um, you know, some of the bills that are in Congress were, you know, came about with a different set of circumstances in mind, with the idea that employees are traveling to different jurisdictions as opposed to working, you know, permanently from home. And so, um, you know, I, you know, I can't see the future, as you mentioned, and, and legislation is always a tricky thing to predict. Um, so, you know, whether those those bills will be enacted in, in this session or in the future, you know, I know that there's been a, a big push behind the, the mobile workforce bill in a variety of contexts for a while, and I think that will continue to occur. Um, you know, but, um, you know, it's just, it's hard to say, as, as you kind of yeah. mentioned. Yeah, it is hard to say, and, and it's true that the mobile workforce has, you know, been in Congress perpetually for years and years now, and it's really addressed towards a mobile workforce that is moving around, um, traveling for business purposes. It's not really a, a law that's well suited for a pandemic situation. But what I think is interesting is that mobile workforce has always kind of been by itself. And I know some iterations of uh, COVID relief bills have tagged on the mobile workforce language. And so I think what will be interesting to see is if there is an additional COVID relief bill, if there is, uh, you know, if, if the mobile workforce component kind of tags along with that and finally passes. All right, uh, I think we have time for probably one more question. I think I might actually put together two questions in one. And um, the first one is, uh, can we just treat all local taxes as a courtesy tax and not withhold them, let them plea, worry about it? So that's part one. And then 
a related question is, and I think it has kind of the same sentiment is, can an employee simply do away with work location tax and simply change everyone to a residential and leave it to the burden of the employee? So I, I read both of these questions as, and I would sum, up, sum them up as, can we just stop withholding and punt this to the employees to handle? Your thoughts? Well, Matt, from I, well, I, no, yeah, I think you know, to Ted put Ted, Ted's point earlier that employers kind of feel like they're caught in the middle here, um, you know, between you know government jurisdiction, state and local, trying to impose a tax, you know, from the employee and, and and employers having this responsibility. So, you know, I don't think it's going to be a feasible, um, you know, they're not going to be able to punt this just totally to the employees. But I think it makes a great point that. Um, you know, we were just talking about legislation and governments need to come to the table with um, a solution of their own. You know, why is this falling on the lap of employers when it's really, you know, the government that's, that's um, you know, trying to impose these taxes, trying to um, fill budget shortfalls during the pandemic. And, and so, you know, I think that everyone needs to be a part of it. Thanks, Dave. And, and Dave I'd, I'd, I'd add on to that that the, the employer has to be uh, cognizant of what obligations it has under existing law and whether it could have any kind of potential exposure uh, for incorrectly withholding. So right. I'd Absol like it to absolutely. go away. <laughs> they just can't click their heels and spin around and have it go away. Well, and systematically, you still have to set that employee up in that location so that you're accumulating the wages. Courtesy withholding doesn't mean you don't need to accumulate the wages. It just means you don't have to submit the taxes. It's the, you know, so don't forget that doesn't get you out of the record keeping type piece of this because you still need to accumulate the wages for that jurisdiction. Um, so from a systematic perspective, that's something to think about. Thanks, Liz. Those are all excellent comments. We have so many more wonderful questions. We're out of time and we don't want to keep any of you over time because we know you have important things to be doing as you go out and try and implement the things that we discussed today. And so we'll close it off there, but please note our email addresses in this final slide. And any of us would be happy to take any questions that you might have that we either overlooked or didn't have time to get to. As we previously mentioned, a recording of the webinar will be sent to all attendees. And this next note is important if you're applying for CLE credit to obtain that CLE credit. Please fill out the survey that will appear after you leave the webinar. And please make sure to answer all of the questions. And for CPE credit, the survey will be included in a follow-up email and a certificate will be sent upon completion. We want to thank you so much for your participation today. We truly hope that this was helpful for you. We understand the enormous pressures that you're, that you're under as you try to navigate a very complex uh, world right now. And as you try to keep uh, the business happy and employees happy. And again, if you have any additional questions, please reach out. But until then, we wish you all a wonderful afternoon and have a great day.